is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome to, our to our webinar on carbon neutrality. My name is Rebecca Fay and I'm Head of Marketing at Natural Capital Partners. I'd like to thank you all for joining us to hear three very different businesses from around the world sharing their experiences of becoming carbon neutral and the benefits it's delivered. To start our program today, we will hear from Jonathan, Jonathan Shopley, Managing Director of Natural Capital Partners, who's going to talk briefly about the role of carbon neutrality has played in climate action and is likely to play going forward. Following Jonathan, I'm delighted to welcome our three guest speakers. Andrew McKenzie from UK-based Commercial Group, a business services company that has used carbon neutrality to transform its brand and its relationship with both customers and suppliers. Josh Prigg comes from a slightly sunnier location in Northern California and will talk about how Fetza Vineyards is leading the wine industry from carbon neutrality right through to regenerative development. And our final speaker is Inigo Canalejo, based in Spain and discussing how Pallet Services Company, Global Pallet Services Company, CHEP, is using carbon neutrality to enhance its sustainability proposition for customers. We will, of course, allow plenty of time for questions at the end, so please use the panel on the right-hand side of your screen to submit anything. You are all muted in listen-only mode, um, and with that, it is my great pleasure to hand over to Jonathan. Thank you, Rebecca, and hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. I'm going to kick us off this afternoon, morning, uh, if you're on the West Coast, uh, with a quick review of um, uh, how carbon neutral evolved as a concept. I'm going to start back in 1890 when uh, uh, Swedish chemist uh, Nobel laureate Svante Arrhenius uh, first identified the potential for greenhouse gases to warm the atmosphere, keep the atmosphere warm, and that if we increased those gases, we might get some warning, uh, additional warming. Um, at that stage, he felt that this would take thousands of years uh, for an increase in gases to actually uh, warm or change the climate. Fast forward then to um, 1995, or 1990 actually, when the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced its first report and found that after 150 years of industrialization, we were already beginning to warm uh, our climate. So um, in 1995, when our company was trading as Future Forests and uh, uh, began um, its, its business in, in 1997, uh, we were responding to the fact that people, uh, civil society, uh, if you look at this column here on the left, were concerned about climate change enough to want to take action. And they did so, and we helped them do so, through um, planting trees, actually, and that's why we were called Future Forests at the time. Sequestration and trees were a wonderful and easily understood icon for action on climate change, and it was a, really a first response. Moving forward then to the early to, uh, 2000s, many of the businesses uh, that were watching the development of climate change as an issue saw that their customers uh, were interested, uh, these members of civil society, in taking action and in fact had been doing so by making their lives or their holidays carbon neutral by planting the requisite number of trees to suck up carbon dioxide and turn it into wood and oxygen. So some of the early mover businesses uh, like Avis, which was involved in obviously travel, uh, strongly associated with greenhouse gases, uh, took on uh, carbon neutral programs and added to the list as it were, of, of interventions, not sequestration through planting trees, but investments uh, in renewable energy projects or energy switching projects from, say, coal to less climate um, damaging gas or to biogas. And they did so, and they were rewarded for doing so, by getting closer customer engagement. Um, all things being equal, customers preferred companies that were taking action on climate change, and in certain industries like uh, the phone or mobile phone industry, it reduced churn as companies, uh, as, as customers, stayed loyal to customers that were taking action on this issue. 
And then, um, and during that time, by the way, we rebranded from Future Forest to Carbon Neutral Company to acknowledge the fact that we weren't just about trees anymore, we were about interventions with projects um, that mitigated climate change across a range of interventions, um, and uh, that we were working internationally. And that means that in uh, the next phase, 2010, there were businesses now beginning to look at placing projects within their supply chains to address climate mitigation and adaptation in their, in their supply chain, like, for example, uh, tea producing companies uh, that wanted to protect their tea growing areas with afforestation projects. But we also found, too, that during this era, um, renewable energy became much more available to corporations to actually reduce their emissions through uh, by selecting uh, renewable energy rather than um, fossil fuel derived energy. And so th if we were to characterize why companies were acting at that stage, it was really future-proofing their businesses. Uh, we got to the stage now where regulation and policy was beginning to move to a point where companies would not be able to emit greenhouse gases at zero cost into the atmosphere, and this is a way in which uh, businesses were taking action themselves and in their supply chains to future-proof themselves and maintain their competitive position. And now, as we move forward um, into uh, towards 2020s, of course, when the Paris Agreement, uh, the new global climate agreement, uh, comes into force, we find that countries now have submitted their targets and their aspirations, and some, like Costa Rica, have made commitments to be carbon neutral in all of their activities across the country uh, by uh, 2022 originally, although they've loosened that a little bit, given them a bit more uh, themselves a bit more of a runway. And what we're finding too is that it's not just early mover businesses and products, but there are sectors like aviation that are committing to carbon neutral growth from 2024 onwards. And um, the kinds of projects uh, uh, that people are using to mitigate include those with significant co-benefits that make contributions to the sustainable development goals, uh, health benefits from clean cook stoves or water filters um, and the like. And where we're headed to now, uh, the why is real action that in its aggregate leads us to climate stabilization. Now, if I can have the next slide, I just want to say a little word about what we did uh, during that journey that I've just described um, to make sure that carbon neutral is a certification mark that has integrity and uh, that people can trust uh, to signal real action to key audiences. In 2002, uh, we first published uh, the Open Proprietary Carbon Neutral Protocol standard under the advice of our advisory forum to represent best practice. And over the years, almost on an annual basis, but more recently now, uh, strictly on an annual basis, we revised the carbon neutral protocol to reflect best practice. And it sets out a very simple five-step process uh, that companies seeking certification need to go through from defining what it is they want to make carbon neutral, measuring the emissions from um, that, uh, that subject, and the subject could be an organization, a product or a service or an event, setting a target, which in the instance of uh, carbon neutral would be net zero, and then in step four, reducing emissions either through internal reductions or through the purchase of carbon credits from these offsetting projects and retirement of those to compensate. And then crucially in step five, communicating with key audiences so that that action uh, delivers value back to the business. And the value back to the business, uh, if I could have um, uh, the build on the right-hand side, um, as we hear it, the sort of generic categories of, of, of value around management control, the very fact of measuring a footprint uh, is a, provides a proxy for energy efficiency in most organizations and certainly has over the years provided benchmarks for organizations to see how well they might be doing against their peers and competitors. The strategic advantage comes from taking action in a way that has visibility and can be signaled to key audiences. The fact that uh, companies are buying carbon uh, credits at a certain price provides a pricing signal that allows carbon neutral companies to decide when they will do an internal reduction because it's cheaper than an offset and when they might uh, use out, out, uh, external uh, reductions through 
carbon, carbon offsetting uh, when they provide um, a cost-effective solution. Internal efficiencies get uh, prioritized through that mechanism. There's the future proofing that I mentioned. Uh, companies that are taking uh, climate management, climate risks seriously, are seeing benefits as the policy and regulatory framework catches up with the issue, and primarily to um, the engagement of key audiences, and I've mentioned customers, but in many of our clients, and we'll hear more about this in a moment, staff engagement around actionable programs on environmental issues as important in climate change are very important in terms of hiring and retaining and motivating uh, staff. So that's a brief summary, but the real detail and the real excitement for me is to hear from uh, the three clients uh, that, we, uh, that, we, that are lined up to tell you about what they're doing. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. And with that, um, I'm very pleased to hand over to Andrew McKenzie from Commercial Group to talk to us a little bit more about um, how they are using the program for um, to transform their brand and engage and build a relationship with customers and suppliers. Over to you, Andrew. Hi, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone and thank you for the opportunity to share a commercial story about becoming a carbon neutral company. So I'm responsible for delivering commercial sustainability program which includes carbon management and uh, offsetting activities. Uh, over the next few minutes uh, I'll let you know why commercial decided to become a carbon neutral company, describe some of the benefits that we've seen, provide some examples of how we use this for, for driving continual improvement and what we're looking forward to. To, to next. Uh, next slide. So by way of an introduction, Commercial Group was founded 26 years ago and is now the UK's largest independent office supplies company. In its simplest form, Commercial supplies everything that can be found within the four walls of an office environment. So if you're currently sat in an office environment listening to this webinar, look at all the things around you it's highly likely that commercial could supply it. Starting with the obvious things, this includes the consumables, the paper, the filing, and the pens. There's also the chair that you're sitting on, and the desk, and the IT you're using. Behind the scenes, you've got your network support systems, and you've probably got some marketing materials there too, whether that's paper or maybe some giveaway items, uh, maybe even a cup of coffee in a mug with your business logo on it. All of these things and many more are items that we supply to customers throughout the UK. Uh, we have a small but growing number of our own product lines, but primarily commercial is a distributor of third-party goods. Commercial is a leader in its sector, establishing a long list of firsts, uh, and this includes being the first to become carbon neutral uh, and uh, the first to become zero waste. Uh, we also use 100% renewable electricity as well. But it hasn't always been this way, and I think that's an important thing for us to recognize. Uh, the moment of enlightenment uh, for the company came in 2006 when one of our founders, Simon, uh, was invited to hear Al Gore present his Inconvenient Truth Lecture. And that was hosted by one of our key customers, uh, Sky Broadcasting. Uh, the presentation had a profound impact on her, uh, in particular reflecting on the world that her family will inherit. Uh, and that triggered the start of Commercial's transformational journey. Uh, Simon continues to be an active part of the business uh, and is board member and sales director uh, and continues to give board level commitment to this uh, agenda uh, point, which again is critical that we've got that top level commitment to pushing forwards on plans and projects. Do you want to go to the next slide? So, on our journey, one of the very first steps for us was to become a carbon neutral company. Quantifying our carbon emissions in 2006 when it started has formed the baseline against which all future steps have been assessed. Following an approved methodology certainly helped us to that end uh, and provided structure and credibility to the output. The methodology has enabled us to systematically consider our carbon emission sources and integrate these processes then into our ISO 14001 accredited environmental management system. 
as part of this formal structure, commercial was able to identify opportunities for continuing improvement. And even today, we have scope for so much more improvement. Some of these improvement areas need to overcome cultural barriers and therefore are going to take longer to become effective uh, through achieving that behavior change. And other opportunities may only become viable through ongoing technological improvement, and I'll share an example of that uh, in a little bit. At the outset of our offsetting activities in 2007, it's probably fair to say that we used offsetting as a way to be carbon neutral, whilst we really just tried to work out how to do that operationally. However, relatively quickly our approach matured to one where we now closely track our emissions and seek further opportunities to eliminate carbon in the first instance uh, and just offsetting the residual uh, at, at the end of that, that period. Since becoming a carbon neutral company, commercial has grown each year at double digit rates and this is against a backdrop of difficult economic times and in a sector that just continues to contract. Uh, whilst there are a number of contributing factors to this success, undoubtedly our efforts to operate in a more sustainable way have contributed significantly. Uh, and this growth has come from our customers and I'll share more about them now on the next slide. So on that slide, that's uh, a list of just some of the, the customers in the UK that we're, we're pleased to be working with. Commercial has a, a very intentional strategy to seek out new customers that, that take their sustainability responsibility seriously. Uh, and, and we look to try and establish a complementary partnership. From the very beginning, customers are informed about commercial's environmental achievements and our carbon neutral status forms the foundation of this conversation. Acknowledging this position leads on to discussions about our low carbon logistics activities and how we can support customers in achieving their carbon management activities alongside a whole range of other added value services. This commitment to communicating with our customers and suppliers about carbon shines through at our annual CSR day. Attended by over 200 guests, the forum builds relationships and enables that free exchange of ideas. Consequently, being carbon neutral is one of the many things that really makes commercial stand out from the competition, and that's enabled us to work with a fantastic range of uh, proactive organizations. Do you want to go to the next slide? I thought I'd take the opportunity to just share with you some of the headline data about our recent carbon emissions and an overview of some of the initiatives implemented. As, as mentioned, commercial's low carbon journey started in 2006. Back then we had annual revenue of about 17 million pounds and CO2 emissions of over uh, 1,100 tonnes per year. This, uh, the carbon intensity was approximately 66 tonnes per million pound of revenue and this subsequently has formed our baseline year. 2007 saw a number of effective and very quick improvements which included switching to 100% renewable electricity. In 2008, we installed an innovative fueling system uh, that blended biodiesel and diesel in real time, enabling us to optimize the blend to the specific vehicle. Uh, and this is still one of the own, only of a handful of similar systems that we're aware of deployed across Europe. In 2011, almost 50 kilowatts of photovoltaics were installed at our head office. And at the time, this was the largest installation in the region. And waste management has been addressed throughout 2013 and continues to be a real focus area for us. Uh, in 2013, we also embarked on a major logistics project that I'll talk about in a second. So the chart on the left-hand side shows our absolute CO2 emissions, and they dropped rapidly between 26, uh, 2006 and 2010, but they have been steadily rising since. I think it's important to note, though, in 2015, our revenue had grown from the baseline by 250%, uh, up to 42 million, uh, and we doubled in staff, yet managed to reduce our carbon intensity to, six, uh, to 14 tonnes per million pound, or approximately 80% reduction. The chart on the right shows the general sources of CO2, uh, and with almost 40% of emissions associated with business travel, this is an area that we're seeking to continually address. Next slide. So on the previous slide, I mentioned a major logistics project that we started. With support 
uh, with financial support from Innovate UK, uh, which is an institution funded by the British government, Commercial has deployed a fleet of hydrogen, diesel, hybrid, light commercial vehicles. We now operate the UK's largest privately owned fleet of hydrogen vehicles, uh, as far as we're aware, and, and we use them within our customer delivery network. These vehicles are defined in the UK as ultra low emission vehicles, and they have an official uh, tailpipe CO2 emission rate of 59 grams per kilometer, uh, equivalent to just 27% compared to the vehicle on which they're based. They also achieve lower emissions of pollutants, including particulates and NOx as well. At present, commercial continues to consider that these vans are the only viable low emission solution this vehicle type within our operating parameters, offering, off, uh, and they offer a limited compromise on range, payload, and refueling time. Deployment of this technology has contributed to the ongoing success of the business by clearly demonstrating to our customers that we're fully committed to tackling the challenge of climate change. Uh, next slide. So, in drawing to a close, I thought I'd share some final thoughts with you on how commercial is moving forward in three areas. So firstly, uh, recently commercial has renewed our carbon neutral commitment. In light of uh, a more holistic engagement process, Commercial has now committed to supporting projects in countries associated with our existing supply chain. It's our intention that this will form part of a, a more consistent dialogue with our stakeholders. Uh, we're also pleased to be able to support several projects that contribute to achieving the, the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals as well. Secondly, in light of recent UN agreements that we've already touched on, Paris and Marrakesh, Commercial is looking uh, towards defining science-based targets for our future carbon emissions. We, we're seeking to better understand what this actually looks like, given that there seem to be so many different approaches uh, and methodologies in play at the moment. Um, so we're looking to adopt an approach that is just robust and credible. Uh, so uh, fundamentally akin to an independent assessment of our carbon footprint, it, it needs to be robust and to stand up to scrutiny. And lastly, referring back to the carbon emissions from our business travel, we're, we're considering mechanisms to push responsibility and accountability for these emissions back towards our divisions, teams, uh, and individuals where those emissions derive. So this could be in a form of a, a carbon pricing model that incentivizes carbon reduction from business travel uh, and then subsequently funds implementation of alternative solutions. So drawing uh, the presentation to, to this bit of the presentation to an end, I hope it's given you some insight to the significance that the commercial places on being carbon neutral and the steps that we've taken in getting there. We found that external verification of our carbon footprint is essential to being able to communicate with confidence the achievements from our efforts. Uh, we've also found that that verification process to be quite smooth and straightforward, but most importantly, what we're continuing to do is acknowledge that we have individual and collective responsibility to, to minimize our carbon uh, emissions to, so that we in turn can minimize the increase in global temperatures. So that's, I'll hand that back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. That was a really um, a great insight into the way that you've used your program. Um, before I hand over to Josh, I just want to write, remind everyone that um, we're getting some questions in. But if you want to use the, uh, if you can use the right-hand panel to write any other questions that you have as the next two presentations occur, that would be terrific. Um, and having said that, I would now um, like to hand over to Josh Pritz. Um, Josh Prigg to talk to us from FETSA Vineyards. Over to you, Josh. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for attending. My name is Josh Priggy. I'm the Director of Regenerative Development at FETSA Vineyards. Um, that's a title that's kind of not only hard to pronounce sometimes, but also hard to describe what that means uh, to some people. But um, Basically, I manage all things sustainability uh, at Fetzer. I've, I've been with the company for about three years, 
and uh, we changed the title to direct uh, regenerative development uh, to be more aligned with the uh, direction that we're heading as a company, which I'll, I'll touch on at the end of my presentation. Um, so we have about 11 different uh, brands of wine in our, our portfolio. Fets are being the largest, um, and then our second largest is uh, Bonterra, which is uh, a wine made with organic grapes. So you can go to the next slide. We're located in Northern California, uh, just about an hour and a half north of San Francisco, um, just north of Sonoma and Napa County, up in Mendocino County, um, in the town called Hopland. We were founded in, in 1968 uh, by Barney Fetzer, and his philosophy was that earth-friendly practices produce better grapes, and of course better grapes produce better wine. Um, so we, we've really had sustainability as a core value at our company since our found, founding in 1968. Next slide. So that, that it's really allowed us to lead the way in the wine industry for, for decades, uh, starting all the way back in the 80s when we committed to growing 100% of our grapes organically. We're one of the largest organic wine grape growers in the U.S., uh, certified by CCOF, and um, we also have a long commitment to renewable energy, uh, becoming the first winery in California to operate on 100% renewable energy back in 1999. Uh, we were the first zero waste certified wine company in the world um, in 2014, certified by the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council. Uh, we were also the first to start publicly reporting our, our greenhouse gas emissions uh, with the Climate Registry back in 2005, and we've worked to reduce those emissions uh, by over 50% since then. Uh, and then in 2015, we um, went for B Corp certification, and we became a certified B Corp, which is um, really kind of a new sector of the economy. It's businesses that are um, they're for-profit businesses, but they're also providing some sort of benefit um, to the world. So the, the carbon neutral certification really, you know, was a natural next step for us as a company um, to, to really continue our leadership in, in sustainability in the wine industry. Next slide. Um, we have 960 acres of uh, vineyards, all organic, but we really go beyond organic and we use regenerative agriculture um, practices, and this is really an important piece of, of our commitment to climate change as well. Um, the Rodale Institute has been studying regenerative agriculture for many years. Um, these studies are showing that the, the levels of, of carbon sequestration in the soil increase greatly when you use regenerative practices. So these are things that build organic matter in our soil, things like planting cover crops. Um, we apply compost every year. We bring in sheep to graze through our vineyards. Uh, we plant certain plants and trees in and around our vineyards to enhance biodiversity. Um, and, and the studies are showing that if all agricultural lands were to transition to regenerative practices, we could actually reverse climate change. We could sequester more carbon in our soil than we emit globally and, and bring down CO2 levels. Next slide. So we were at COP21 in um, in Paris in 2015, invited to speak about um, what we're doing to address climate change at, at Fetzer uh, with our long commitment to renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, and, and zero waste, and really how climate change you really uniquely impacts the wine industry. You know, we need certain climates to produce quality grapes, and changes in those climate climates can really have a big impact on the quality of fruit that we're able to grow and the wine that we're able to make. So we were there um, at the Caring for Climate Business Forum um, at, at COP21, and, and that's where we learned about the United Nations Climate Neutral Now program. Um, this is uh, an initiative to get businesses and um, organizations to commit to um, reporting their greenhouse gas emissions, reducing their emissions, and then offsetting um, any remaining emissions. Next slide. 
So we'll look at, at kind of the, the journey uh, of our climate change and what led to our carbon neutral certification reporting back in 2005, um, just joining the, the United Nations climate neutral now. So that re that is what required us to take that last step really to, to purchase offsets and offset our remaining emissions. Um, and of course we use natural capital partners uh, for that and, and we thought it would be a good idea just to to go for the certification, um, to just have that have that seal of approval and that stamp that shows that um, we've taken all the proper steps in, in our reporting, in the verification of our reporting, and the and the purchasing of offsets. And we also uh, in 2016 we joined Series Bicep uh, Business for Innovative Climate and Energy Policy, and this is a, a coalition of businesses um, through the United States that that uh, advocate for smart climate and energy policy in the United States. So when there's um, pot potential um, policy being made in, in government, uh, this organization will, will get these businesses together and, and sign letters of support. It really allows us to, um, you know, not just lead by what we do, but lead by what we say and be uh, an advocate for, for the things that, that we believe in. Next slide. And just to look at how our carbon neutral certification uh, falls into our, our larger picture, our larger overall strategy uh, for sustainability. Uh, this is just a look, a look at the history of, of corporate responsibility um, and where we see it going in the future and where we want to lead. Um, starting back in the 80s, you know, we had corporate philanthropy and companies were um, creating foundations and, and uh, donating in their communities and doing good works projects, uh, a lot of it PR driven. In the 90s it was corporate social responsibility so companies were taking these good works projects that they were doing and bringing them within their own boundaries um, and this is when the term triple bottom line uh, became used a lot. Companies were focusing on people, planet and profit uh, and then in the, the 2000s it was corporate sustainability uh, or corporate sustainable development so Companies were hiring sustainability managers, creating departments focused on sustainability because they realized they could create a competitive advantage, uh, not just by reducing operating costs, but by, um, you know, the, the consumers were starting to demand uh, these things from, from businesses. And where we see it evolving and where we want to lead the way is corporate regenerative development. So this is the idea that, you know, minimizing our negative impacts are not going to be enough to, to meet the global issues that we face. Um, so we want to focus on, on not just minimizing, but actually completely eliminating our negative impacts and actively creating positive impacts uh, for our, our ecosystems and our communities. So sustainable development we see as, as about minimizing negative impacts, regenerative development uh, about eliminating those negative impacts and maximizing our positive impacts. So carbon neutral is an important piece of that. Um, neutralizing our, our carbon impacts. And we're actually doing a, a, a research study partnering with UC Merced to um, calculate the amount of carbon being sequestered in our vineyards and in our wildlands um, so that we can we can actually show people, you know, if, if we're sequestering more carbon than we're emitting as a company. Next slide. So we've taken a, a couple steps. Uh, I mentioned in this direction. I mentioned B Corp certification earlier. The other step we we took was to create a goal. So if we're a, a regenerative company focused on um, making positive impacts and eliminating our our negative impacts, what would the ultimate goal of that be? And it it would be to become net positive. Um, so so having a positive corporate footprint, and that was our our goal that we've put in place by 2030. So we want to be sequestering more carbon than we emit and we want to be water positive, um, putting more water back into our aquifers than, than we take out. Uh, next slide. So we have a, a dedicated um, page here on our website at fetzer.com. It's backslash carbon neutral and this is just a, a way to um, educate our consumers or our stakeholders, uh, anybody who wants to learn about our, our mission, uh, our journey towards carbon neutrality. Um, so we have all kinds of, of great information there to, to talk about what it means. Um, next slide. 
we had an infographic put together uh, that talks about uh, why it's important to offset our emissions um, and and you know what this means for us as a company and um, next slide we'll show you the different projects that we're supporting uh, so these are the different offset projects uh, that we are supporting to achieve carbon neutrality um, so it's been great to to connect and and with with our stakeholders and and educate them and tell them what it means and and why uh, why it's important to us and I think that's the last slide I have if you go to the next slide yes that's the last slide I have so uh, just a, a little background on on our mission towards carbon neutral and um, look forward to any questions thank you Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, we do have quite a few questions coming in, but before we get to those, um, I'm pleased to hand over to Inigo Canalejo, um, who's coming speaking to us from Spain around about uh, CHEP's program on carbon neutrality. So, uh, Inigo, over to you. Thank you. Good day, everyone, and uh, thanks for giving me uh, the opportunity to present uh, the company I work for. I uh, actually work for Brambus. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, Brambus is the holding company. Uh, it's a global company, uh, a B2B company for those of you that don't know us. Uh, we operate in over 50 countries around the world. It's actually located in Australia and it's a, a public company that trades in the Australian Stock Exchange. We have quite a history, a 138-year-old company uh, with over 14,000 employees and around 500,000 collection points. And obviously this doesn't, probably doesn't mean any, anything to anyone right now, but as I explain what we do as a business, it make, make more sense. Um, if what you, what you can see in the, in the center circle here is what we do as a business. We, we are a, a pooling company. So we rent uh, assets to our customers in the supply chain. We work with the world's largest players in the supply chain consumer good companies and also uh, fruit and veg companies and retailers as well. Uh, we have over uh, 2,000 uh, global customers and we operate through uh, three, basically two main uh, business brands. One is called Chet Pallets, which some of you might be familiar with, and the other one is called IFCO that manages what we call RPC, reusable plastic containers, uh, mainly in the fresh produce uh, sector but also working with uh, retailers in the supply chain. Um, what we do is we rent our equipment to these companies that share and reuse this equipment throughout their supply chains. Um, we have around 500 million assets uh, globally that our customers reuse and share amongst them. Um, our pooling model is, is basically a living example of the circular economy. It's a product that is being uh, reused uh, time after time. We have a network of what we call service centers that inspect and repair our assets as needed. And then those assets are actually shared with the next user in the supply chain. Um, having scale, we are actually the largest uh, pooling service in the world. And this allows us to, to be close with our, with our customers and to generate scale with, with, with what we do as a business. And this has a positive environmental impact, which I will shortly describe. I think also it's important to understand that what we provide is a service uh, and not, uh, so we provide product as a service. So our companies, our, our customers rent our assets as part of a service that we provide to them. If we move to the next slide, I, I briefly want to tell you a little bit about our sustainability program and our story. You know? um, I'm happy to say that you know I wake up in the morning and I work for a sustainable business and that makes us really proud and we're very fortunate to, to be that way. And let me explain to you why. Our business model is intrinsically sustainable for two main reasons. One is, as I mentioned, is based on the share and reuse model. So that means we are um, creating products that can be reused over and over again. That means we can minimize the use of natural resources required uh, to make our products and to be for our products to be used. 
and we obviously also reduce the waste associated with the use of our products. So the longer we can extend the life of our products, the more sustainable we are and the smaller the environmental impacts. But also, as I mentioned before, the fact that we are the largest player in the market and usually the largest pooling service provider in each of the countries where we operate allows us to reduce transport distances. And transport distances are, play a big role in the sustainability impact of these products. We are close to our customers, so we can deliver on short distance. But we're also close to our uh, retailers, where we collect those assets. And that means that we can collect on short distance as well, and therefore eliminate empty miles. Our scale also allows us to collaborate with our customers, which I will mention uh, before, uh, in, in a moment. Uh, secondly, we're not just going to just sit there and say, yes, we have a sustainable business model, that's great, and let's just you know, use that. We're actually very conscious about driving our sustainability program to become more sustainable, reduce our environmental impacts. Back in 2010, we set our, uh, our uh, first sustainability goals that were targeted for 2015. We had uh, goals that were addressing targets like CO2 reduction, waste reduction, and sustainable sourcing uh, policies, and we have actually achieved those goals. In 2015, we decided to set a new set of goals uh, that were even more uh, embracing to our business, of what we do as a business, covering some of these topics that I mentioned, but also expanding them to other things, such as our contribution to the communities, impact uh, on water and food waste. We have actually aligned our new 2020 goals with uh, the United Nations SDGs, uh, which obviously gives a little bit of a, of a bigger purpose to what we do as a company. And then the third point on our sustainability strategy is because of our unique uh, value proposition around sustainability and our unique business model, we can actually work with our customers and help them to become more sustainable. I was talking about scale before, um, the fact that we have a, a fairly large business and a large operation in the majority of the countries where we operate allows us to, for example, set transport collaboration programs with many of our customers. We currently collaborate with over 170 companies worldwide in sharing transport. Sharing transport obviously generates cost reduction, but it also generates a, a better environmental impact, basically environmental impact reduction through the elimination of trucks and the elimination of empty truck miles, which is one of the biggest challenges that the supply chain currently has. We can move to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we have done is measure uh, what is the environmental impacts of our products and compare it to the alternatives in the market. So I made the point about our business model being intrinsically sustainable we wanted to make sure that we can actually demonstrate that with facts, with real figures and with a scientific study. So we have performed life cycle analysis through, well, independently run life cycle analysis through uh, ISO certification and peer-reviewed studies that can calculate scientifically what the environmental impacts of our products are. No? Um, we look initially at, obviously, what comes into our share and reuse model, so the type of and raw materials that we, that we use currently, uh, over 97% of the timber that we use for our pallets comes from certified sources globally, and around 30% of all of the plastic that goes into our RPC is actually recycled plastic. Then we have all of the benefits of the share and reuse model, so basically creating sustainable value to our customers. The fact that they are using our assets, our service, is actually minimizing their environmental impacts, and we can quantify that through these scientific studies. And you can see some of the results here. This is actually an extract from our 2016 sustainability review globally, and I'll just highlight a couple of numbers. No? I mean, our, our business, our business is, is helping reduce, saving 1.4 million trees, for example, or our collaboration initiatives with our customers in the supply chain is helping eliminate 35,000 tons of CO2 and 35 million empty kilometers. Also, if we include uh, multi-model uh, uh, work as well. So again, having scale and having a sustainable business model allows us to have a very positive impact and create sustainable value for our customers. 
Now, where does carbon neutral come into play? If we move to the next slide, I'll explain to you the way that we have fitted it in, which is quite a natural fit with what we're doing. So let's imagine we were trying to understand, if we look at chip pallets, for example, how our customers are benefiting from using our assets. So on this simple graph, you can see on the, on the y-axis uh, a carbon footprint of a product uh, based on this life cycle analysis. And then we have the different uh, CHEP initiatives uh, that are being implemented on the x-axis. No? So our starting point would be a non-pooling solution that generates, uh, let's say, a bigger amount of CO2. Uh, when our customers convert from this, let's say, non-sustainable solutions to, to a CHEP share and reuse model, they're already reducing their carbon footprint by usually over 50%. And we have our sustainability program within the company where we are focusing on reducing, further reducing that footprint through different measures so that reduces the footprint of our product. And then of course we have this customer collaboration uh, program that is uh, generating uh, tons of savings as you have seen in the previous slide. So at the end of the day, after all of these initiatives, we have been able to greatly reduce the environmental impact of our product. And really, what's left is quite a small carbon footprint of our product. So well, that's when we thought, OK, this is an opportunity for us to go one step further and make it carbon neutral for our customers. In my last slide, I'd like to explain how we are using carbon neutral uh, in different ways. The first one, as I mentioned, is with our customers. So this is just an example, for example, on one of, one of our customers that is using carbon neutral pallets. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, brewers in Spain and also a global leader, Mao San Miguel. Mao San Miguel is, is, is using carbon neutral pallets. Uh, they renewed our contract uh, a couple of years ago and carbon neutral was one of the reasons on top of our sustainability value proposition, obviously, um, to, to choose a CHEP as a, as a service provider. Uh, they get to choose, our customers get to choose the project that they want to invest on. And this project can be aligned with their own CSR strategy. So, for example, Mao San Miguel invested on our project in India, where they were actually starting their operations with a brewery there. So it's very much aligned with uh, their own strategy. We're also offering a carbon neutral products to our customers. Last year, we renewed our quarter pallet, and that was basically 20 years old. We have a brand new pallet on the market. This pallet has a lot of uh, enhancements in terms of sustainability, so its carbon footprint was greatly reduced by over 30% versus the previous version. Uh, we made it lighter, we made it more stackable, it's uh, made out of 100% recycled plastic. So we've done all of, the thing, all, of this, all of the work in terms of innovation and product development, but we also decided to go one step further and offer this pallet as a carbon neutral zero emissions pallet to our customers which has been greatly appreciated in the market. Uh, we're also offering carbon neutral for specific regions within our business. So for example, in Europe, our Czech Nordics business is a fully a carbon neutral business uh, with regards to the products we offer to our customers. And this is a business decision where we see where sustainability is particularly relevant to a specific region. And then lastly, we're also doing the small things internally as well, like our carbon neutral meetings. So our leadership uh, meetings in Europe are all carbon neutral. All of the emissions are compensated through natural capital partners. And in fact, in 2016, we also had our first uh, board meeting that was carbon neutral uh, with our, with our uh, Australian uh, board meeting in Madrid. So as a summary, I would like to highlight you know, the, 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 the fact that, yes, we do have a unique business model that is sustainable. That is a great starting point, I have to say. Uh, we have a unique position in the supply chain to have an impact in, in our customers and their environmental impacts. And we have chosen to use carbon neutral as a value driver and a differentiator in the value that we can bring to our customers with regards to sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Inigo, and thank you, everyone, for your um, presentations. I have a few questions that have come in. Um, so we have, in the final sort of 10 minutes, I'm going to try and get through three or four of them. Um, so I won't waste any time. And first of all, um, a question for 
all three of you, in fact, which I'm going to then ask each of you one by one to respond to, could you each comment on how you have engaged your employees in your carbon neutral program? So if perhaps I could ask Andrew to give us a brief response first, and then we'll go on to Josh and to Inigo. Uh, yes, yeah, so Commercial has been running a, a program internally called Green Angels, which is uh, a scheme whereby employees get to uh, be challenged to deliver a transformational change to the business, long-lasting transformational change. They are encouraged to choose one of ten environmental commitments that we've listed and documented. Uh, one of those is uh, to do with reducing carbon, another is to do with uh, leadership uh, and innovation, and so we use that program to, to drive uh, various programs. Uh, examples of projects delivered include uh, waste management. Three of the teams have tackled the thorny issue of how to reduce waste, how to segregate waste, how to recycle more, how to produce less waste, all of which obviously contributes to our carbon footprint. So they have delivered a couple of remarkable projects to significantly reduce our operational waste. Um, I could talk to you for hours about how many more examples would you like. We, we've got uh, bike sheds and encourage uh, staff to cycle to work. Um, uh, and uh, we've recently installed living walls uh, on the outside of our premise as part of softening aesthetically uh, what is fundamentally a, an industrial building, but also um, recognizing that additional vegetation on the front of a building is good for uh, one's soul uh, as well as local air quality, uh, and that in turn does have some carbon capture. Uh, element to it as well, albeit very small. Great, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, Josh, any um, quick thoughts from you on employee engagement in your program? Yeah, we've we've had a long, long history of of engaging employees in sustainability. We have something similar, um, a team. It's called the Re Three Team, stands for Revitalize, Regenerate, and Restore. And and um, this is a a team of employees from all departments of the company who, who get together once a month to advance um, sustainability projects and um, I know they were all very proud when we were able to achieve carbon neutral. Um, a lot of the projects you know uh, contribute to lowering greenhouse gas emissions, a bike share program to encourage people to bike instead of uh, instead of driving. We um, the group built uh, an employee garden, so we have about 60 employees growing their own food at work now, um, waste audits for the departments, and they also uh, a couple years ago started creating a, a newsletter. Um, so we have an employee written and designed newsletter that comes out about four times a year, um, and that's just to really communicate uh, and engage all the employees uh, with, with sustainability and what, and what that team is doing. And, and what we're doing as a company in, in regards to sustainability. So, um, yeah, a lot of great programs to really just get employees engaged and, and make them aware of, of all these things that we're doing. Thanks, Josh. Um, Inigo, I'm sure that you have plenty to say about um, the engagement of staff, but actually another question has come in that I think people would be really interested to hear about is specifically around your customer engagement. You mentioned in your presentation that um, Spanish, the Spanish brewer has renewed their contract based on your carbon neutrality and um, that in uh, Norway, where it's in the Nordics where it's particularly relevant, you've made the whole product range carbon neutral, but would be really interested to hear yeah, um, yeah, what it's a sort of top tip from you when it comes to engaging customers with a carbon neutral service, what would be your main piece of advice to give um, other companies to think about when they're looking at something like that? Great, yeah, I think uh, summarizing probably the, the best tip I could give is just to keep it simple, to make it simple for customers. The majority of our customers are large, complex, multinational organizations that have 
uh, very complex decision making processes as well. So uh, what we have found in our journey when we started Carbon Neutral back in 2013 is that the simpler we make the decision uh, process, the more successful we're going to be. So initially when we started talking about carbon neutral and the possibility of our customers becoming carbon neutral with our products, they loved it, everybody loves it, and everybody wants to do it. But uh, then, you know, it gets somewhat lost within their decision making process and it doesn't, it might not be a priority at the time, etc. So the, the easier we make it for them, the better. And that's what we have done, you know, integrated as much as we can uh, within the rest of our value proposition so that it's almost a no-brainer. Uh, for them to work with this and, and to, to value uh, the, basically the, the benefit of, of becoming carbon neutral. Thank you very much. I think I've got time to squeeze in two more questions. So another one for you, Andrew, um, on similar lines but about suppliers. Can you tell us a little bit about what you think has been most effective about getting your suppliers to take action and what sort of results you've seen from that? Uh, yeah, I think it, it's all about partnership and the way we try and work with our suppliers is that it's a very much partnership based arrangement. One of our uh, product lines uh, and, and service offerings is a toner take back program whereby we are trying to uh, again engage with a supplier to produce a product that has a, a lower overall carbon footprint associated with the, the broader logistics and remanufacturing. Um, issues and so that's been a real win for us in terms of uh, driving more uh, awareness I, I suppose uh, both to the suppliers but also with them it's allowed us to have uh, an open conversation about how processes can be improved um, and sharing the learning that, that we're both bringing to, to the table so our uh, alternative cycling has been a, uh, a very significant uh, area for that. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And I think one final question which I have for you, Josh, is, um, you know, you talked about how climate change critically impacts, impacts the wine industry, and we know you, know you have been a leader in taking action in that, but how much are you seeing your peers and your competitors following that lead? I think we're, we're really seeing a lot of that in, um, in California, um, in the California wine industry, definitely, um, especially with, with the water issues in California and, and being in a drought. Um, I think it's, it's more and more important that vineyards are operating in a, in a sustainable, low-carbon way that is, you know, drought-resilient, climate-resilient. Uh, there's great programs. Uh, out here in California to engage vineyards and wineries in um, in sustainable practices. We have the, the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, which created a, a certification program, uh, the California Certified Sustainable Wine Growing Program, which uh, assesses all, all aspects of, of a winery and, and vineyard uh, operations and um, that program is growing. We're getting more and more uh, wine companies on board and, and certified. So uh, I think we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of people getting really engaged with, with this. Great. Thank you very much. Uh for that, Josh, um, and I'd like to thank everyone once again for all uh, for coming, joining us for the webinar, and also for all of those questions. We're uh, right coming up to the top of the hour, so I'm going to call um, an end to the webinar now. I just would like to remind you all um, that the webinar will be available on our website, and if you would like to share the link with uh, colleagues and customers, please do, and you will receive an email shortly giving you uh, the location of it on our website. But once again, thank you very much to our speakers, and thank you all for your attendance.